טוב, ברוך אתה ה' אלוהים לכל עולם שהכל נהיה מדורו. Before we start, I got a certain question asked so many times lately, so I thought maybe of answering that question here because it applies to, to many people. And the question is broken into different groups, but the main topic is where does sicknesses and illnesses, and especially mental illnesses, come from? If they come from something that we are responsible for, is it come from something that we can control, or it's something way above us? For the sicknesses, for the body illnesses, then I have a three-hour lecture online that I explain in a very thorough and deep way, why do we get sick? Where does it come from? Because ultimately everything comes from, from Hashem, and ultimately everything comes from a spiritual realm. And we have control over everything. The short version of the answer of the, of the body, the sickness that we get in the body is, is that we know that we have 248 positive mitzvot, <coughs> and we have 365 negative mitzvot. The 248 positive mitzvot correspond to the 248 limbs that we have in our body, which they correspond to the 248 limbs that Hashem Kiv Yechol has. Hashem doesn't have limbs, but He has 248 channels how He gets dressed into this world. The Zohar calls it Evarim de Malka, the limbs of the king. But these spiritual limbs, they manifest into our body, into physical limbs. We know that our nefesh, the lowest part of our neshama, has 248 kochot, powers, 248 kochot and nefesh. And these 248 kochot and nefesh, the powers of our nefesh, they are a manifestation of the powers of Hashem, of the limbs of Hashem, and they get dressed into our body. And the body, therefore, has 248 limbs. When a person keeps all 248 mitzvot, then the limbs are full with the power of the nefesh. Now imagine a glove that has, you know, the gloves that we know, they have five fingers, but imagine a glove that has 248 fingers, and you put your hand in, and you know, in, in this world, you have a puppet, you move your finger, then the hand of the puppet moves. And you move this finger, then the hand of the puppet moves. And then you move around, and the whole puppet makes a show. So that's kind of the same way how the nefesh gets dressed into the body and moves the body, because the neshama is way, it's too holy to operate in the body. So the neshama gets dressed in garments, in levushim. We know there are major three garments, thought, speech, and action. And each one of these groups of garments are broken down into many other garments. But the nefesh gets dressed into the body and it moves the body. <clears throat> in order for the nefesh to be completely dressed into the body 100%, one needs to do all 248 positive mitzvot. If one does all 248 positive mitzvot, then the nefesh is completely in the body and it's functioning 100%. Once a person stops from doing one mitzvah, what happens is that the light of the mitzvah, when I do a positive mitzvah, then I bring down light into the world. The difference between a positive mitzvah and a negative mitzvah, a negative mitzvah, it's a precept, it's I just block, I stop. I do the motion of gvura, of refraining, I'm just stopping something from coming in. That's why it's much easier to do tshuva on a, per, on a negative mitzvah. If I didn't do something, one of the negative mitzvot, it's much easier to do tshuva because I just did a, a blemish on something and I can reverse it. But a positive mitzvah, I actually bring down light into the world. I actually bring Hashem into the world. And if I miss the positive mitzvah, then I, I miss that opportunity. If I have to put tefillin fill on, on every day, and I didn't put one day tefillin on, or any other positive mitzvah, I miss the opportunity to do a, a positive action of bringing some type of godly light into the world. <coughs> <coughs> So when a person does a positive mitzvah, he fills the spiritual organ with this godly light, which manifests into the body. 
And if I miss one positive mitzvah, then this godly light doesn't penetrate into the nefesh. Therefore, the part of the nefesh that gets dressed into the body is empty and becomes a, a, a halal. Halal is like a gap, a space. That's why you see that halal has the same word, the same letters of the word chole. Chole is sick and halal is space. When there's a halal, when there's no spiritual light in the organ, becomes a space, becomes a halal, because the nefesh is not there, and then the organ becomes chole, becomes sick. <coughs> and that's how physically we get sicknesses in this world. It's much more complex. Like I said, if you want, go look at the lecture online. It's called The Source of Illnesses. It's a very interesting lecture. But the point to understand is that the physical sickness, it has to get dressed in nature. A person can be the most healthiest person in the world and still get sick. And the proof to that is that we see that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, when he was in the cave for 12 years, he only drank water, he only ate carobs, he didn't bathe, he didn't see sunlight, nothing. When he came out of the, of the cave, he was totally healthy. He didn't have any, any problems. Because spiritually, he fed his soul, his nefesh, so it manifests into the body, and the body didn't get affected. And in this world, you see a person that can be totally healthy, only eat healthy things, don't smoke, no, don't, do, don't expose himself to anything, and still get sick. Because <clears throat> the sickness doesn't originate from the body, it originates from a spiritual place. But even, even the genetic disease, it's an, it originates from somewhere. Everything originates from a spiritual realm. Now, mainly what the question that I get from many people is where does this uh, mental il illness come from? Because a m mental is not an organ. Yeah, I can understand. Something physical happens. It's like I just said from the mitzvot. But where does a mental illness come from? Now, men mental illnesses, some of them are, like you said, genetic. They are born with. And a lot of the mental il illnesses are, are, are created in this world. Now, mel mental illness, it can be depression. It can be anxieties, it can be fears, it can be OCD, it can be ADD, all these uh, you know, acronyms that they're inventing now. It's something that comes from this world. And unfortunately, most of the people in this world, they're dealing with some type of a mental illness. <clears throat> and it sounds you know, bad and, and, and embarrassing or extreme to say mental illness. But the same person, a person can have a, a rash, a person, it's not as embarrassing, a person can have a mental illness. The question that I get is, where does it come from? Where does people get mental illnesses? Why do people get depressed? Why do people get anxieties? They're ADD, they can't concentrate, they can't sit still, they, you know, OCD, all sorts of different things that people deal with. And the reality is that most people deal with these things. So, first of all, everything originates from a spiritual place. Nothing comes down to this world before it has a makor, has a, 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 an original place in the, in the world above. Which means if you want to see what's going on above, you look what's going on here. There's a Mishnah in Masechet Avod that it says, Dama lemala mimach, ayin roa, ozen shoma, know what's above you, there's an eye that looks, an ear that hears, kol masecha basefer nechtavim, all your deeds are written in the book. So this is the pshat of the, the, the Mishnah, the simple explanation of the Mishnah, that know that there's something above you, there's an eye that sees, an ears that listens, all your actions are written in a book. But comes Baalatani and he says, no, your reading is wrong. You have to read it, Dama lemala mimach. Know that what's above you is from you. We control the spiritual realms. We see it in many different places. We see that when they used to uh, uh, sanctify the moon, when they used to decide about the dates, they used to do it according to witnesses that sees the moon, and they would go to the Beidin, and they would say, we saw the moon, and that's how the Beidin would decide today's Rosh Chodesh. Now we're using calendars, we're spoiled, but in the olden days, they would wait for witnesses to see the moon, they would run to the Beidin, and that's how they decided the, the, the month. And it was so uh, 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 depending on us 
that they used to, the Malachim, the angels used to go to Hashem and say, wait, when is Yom Kippur, when is Rosh Hashanah, when is Pesach? So he said, we have to wait to the base Din of Mata, of the, the court down there to decide, and according to that, we'll have our Yom Tov. So, we see that everything that we do in this world, we are responsible to the world above. Even though everything originates from a world above, it's like a kind of a give and take relationship. What I do in this world affects the world above, and what happens in the world above affects the world below. So ultimately anything comes from the world above. But when it comes to these spiritual sicknesses, half of them, now this is a very broad topic, I just want to touch a few things because it's no get to us. And that's why I chose to start with that, is because half of these sicknesses, we, we bring them on, on us. I'm talking about the mental and, uh, uh, sicknesses. And the same way how the Balatani says, Dama le mala mimach, know what's above you is from you, is because I do certain actions and I bring on myself a certain energy, a certain hamshacha, a certain power. And it starts with, first of all, with basic things, is that my, 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 my actions. <clears throat> now, if you're looking at it a physical way, half of what we eat in this world will affect our, our health and our mental health. And half of what we eat in this world is totally poison. If you look at half of what you eat, you'll see that it's, it's not even food. That's the main problem, which, which, which most people totally uh, ignore. But our, our, our food is the main problem and the main, main source of a lot of our problems. If a person will be very particular with what they eat, they'll see that half of their, their mental and physical issues are, are, are over. And that's not only in the actual physical things of eating sugar and, 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 uh, and all sorts of processed food, but it's the kosher diet. Because most people say, oh, I'm very kosher. What are you, what are you talking about? I, I'm 100% I'm kosher. But the reality is that most people that even eat kosher, they don't even eat 100% kosher. They're not particular with certain things. They're not particular with how they separate the meat and the dairy. They're not particular with how much time they wait. And so forth. And the Arizal was very, very particular about all the little things and, and explaining that the slightest thing that you miss in kosher, it right away directly affects your neshama. Right away. And not too long ago, some, I had a guest and he was like, he, he, I saw him pull out like a bag of chocolate. And I told him, you know, we, we ate not too long ago. He's like, no, it's like almost six hours. So I says, okay, why almost six hours? Don't you want to be six hours? And I say, yeah, it's almost six hours. I don't, I don't remember when we finished. We finished at two or three. And it doesn't matter. I told him, yes, it matters. He's like, no, 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 come on. No, you're a fanatic. Well, they might, I'm not a fanatic. The rule says six hours. I'm waiting six hours. Not five hours and 59 minutes and 57 seconds. Six hours and one second. And I'm, since I don't know if it's exactly six hours, I wait six hours and five minutes. And yes, these couple seconds will affect you. To a point that the, the Arizal explains that anything that has to do with kosher, and the more extreme it is, extreme, I mean more, more refined it is, will affect your nefesh in a, in a much more severe way. To a point that Arizal says that metamtem metasechel, metamtem doesn't mean from the word stupid, metumtam, metamtem means imbalance. Person, uh, the, the sechel, the mind, the intellect becomes not balanced. By me not being particular about a few seconds between the meat and the dairy, or if I'm looking at microscopic bugs on, the, on, the, on my leaves, or whatever it is. So a lot of it originates from our food and how particular we are. Not too long ago I was in a lecture, I had the videos online, it's a funny video that this woman argues with me and she tells me I'm 100% per, uh, uh, kosher, but I don't believe wine needs to be kosher. So I buy whatever wine I want. And I told her, Dafka wine? That, especially wine? That you want to be even more particular with wine. There's so many dinim in it and even mystical things in the wine that you, you don't want to be kosher in. And it started a whole argument, and then I gave her some example with a, with a, a, a spoon. And I told her, you know, if you now make yourself a, a hot cup of co uh, coffee, boiling hot cup of coffee, and you stir the coffee with a spoon, and this coffee has milk in it, and the water is boiling, 
Right now the spoon got the taste, it absorbs the taste of the, of the dairy. This spoon now is a dairy spoon. And half an hour later, or an hour later, you're very makpid with your chalav to basar, from dairy to meat. An hour later you have soup. Boiling hot chicken soup. You know, it's for the, to make the example better, it's soup with meat. And you take this spoon and you put it into the soup that an hour ago you mixed the coffee with it. And now you're putting it in the soup that has meat in it. Right now the soup, the heat of the soup opened the pores of the spoon. The taste of the milk just went out of the spoon into the soup. Now the soup is treif. You can't eat the soup. And if the soup is boiling, boiling hot, even the spoon and the bowl are now taref. You can't eat it. You can't use it anymore. Excuse me? It doesn't matter if I'm a mistake. If I by mistake run through a red light, I still go into an accident. Isn't it one in six feet? Like, is the meat a meat thing and a bouncing Okay, I'm not going to get, we're not going to do a shiu. I understand. We're not going to do a class now about all the dinim in halacha and say, you know, battle bishishim. I don't want to go into the halacha here. That's not the point. I was trying to make a point with that particular woman that the din, let's assume that it's not 60th. Let's assume that, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to go, go into the dinim now. You want one time, we'll do a shiur in halacha, and we'll do all the halachot, all the, the laws regarding to mistakes. Even mistakes in our life we pay for. I gave you the example, I don't know if you heard me, but you run through a red light by mistake, you run into an accident. You still, happen, you still do the accident. It was a mistake. Yeah, but there's still a reaction. So even in mistakes in this world, I'm not saying you're going to be hung now on a tree. But the point is that even when we do mistakes, still there's a reaction. And again, I don't want to go into the dinim. I was just giving an example with, the, with this. And I told her, right now, this is now all not kosher. And she thought that I'm completely crazy. She was like, oh, I know you, all you... Religious people, you're fanatic. I just don't eat this uh, meat and dairy. I don't do this, I don't do that. The point is what I'm trying to say is that even when you do something by mistake in the area of kosher, it still affects your body. You still have to do tshuva for that. You still have to clean your body for that. You know that if a person, chas v'shalom, eats meat and dairy, by mistake, he ate, he ate whatever. He didn't keep the, the, the enough time. You know, the Sephardim, they go, the Ben Ishchai, you have to, says you have to fast. You have to fast at least one time to get the, the, the to, to do some type of a tikkun. So, the point is that our food really affects us, whether it's a mistake or not a mistake, it affects our, our, our body, but mainly it affects our nefesh, what, what, what it will do, it will do what's called the timtuma sechel, the, the mind is not going to be 100% uh, focused, which will affect our body with all sorts of the, these disorders. So our food, whether it's on the physical level, physical level I mean like poison food, the meds, half the stuff that you go into the supermarket, you see it's, it's poison. Half the food, sometimes my kids come home with all sorts of junk from school, I don't even know why they're giving it to children. Then they're, they're, they're they wonder why the kids are all hyper and, and not concentrating and ADD and RDD and BBB and all these acronyms that they're making up. Just look at the food. Mama, I'm not joking. It's just at, the, at the, how the food is, is done here. Everything in, the, in Israel is with MSG, with this chemical that gives taste into the food, which is like a poison. It's literally poison. You know, all the food has food coloring in it. My kids, sometimes they come home with these rubber things, like rubber bands, with good taste. It's like eating a rubber band that has a nice smell and taste. Chemicals that make it smell good and chemicals that make it taste good and chemicals that make it look good and it's a rubber band. Might as well just eat a piece of rubber band. And then everybody gets, you know, they come up with question, why is everybody going crazy here? So this is just on the physical level with our nutrition, with our food, but the food also with the laws of kosher affect our body right away. But other things is that when a person does sins, when he's, do, when he's you know, for before we talked about the positive mitzvot, when a person doesn't do the negative mitzvot, that directly affects our body. Because what happens is that the positive mitzvot, they bring in the light, the godly light into the body. They bring the, the chayut, the life, into the nefesh. But when I don't guard it, 
Not that I don't do it, when I don't guard it, a person can be the most religious person in the world. All day long, learn Torah, be 100% machmir about every little particular thing, but then he's not guarding the negative mitzvot. The negative mitzvot are my, my, my walls that I'm guarding from anything from, to come from the outside and take the kedusha that's in my body. I, my body is soaked with kedusha. Every day I fill my body with holiness. I do mitzvot, I learn Torah, I do everything that I need to do. My body is radiating with kedusha. And if I don't guard it, comes all sorts of things from the outside. The Rizal calls it chitzonim, something that comes from the outside. And it takes some of your kedusha. Like you have a, a fancy house. The whole house is full with, uh, with expensive artwork and electronics and money on the table. And you just leave the door open. And robbers just come in and they take it. The worst part comes is that sometimes the robbers come in and they say, Hey, what a beautiful place. Why should I take the, the pictures off the walls and go out? Let me just stay in the house. Let me just camp here. And that's, you know, in the physical world it doesn't really work like that. But in the spiritual world, when a person doesn't guard his body, his soul, then comes all sorts of visitors from the outside and they want to bite a piece of the Kedusha. The terminology of Kabbalah is linok. To suck like a baby that sucks his mother's, uh, uh, to, to suck ma milk out of his mother, his linok. So these klipot, they suck kedusha off you. And if I don't guard my body, then I'm giving away all my kedusha. <clears throat> the main problem where most of these sicknesses come from is at night when we go to sleep. When a person goes to sleep, the body stays on the bed, the neshama goes up to shamaim. And the body is like a, a, like a dead corpse. Our sages say that, death, that sleeping is 60th of a death. But the reality is that the neshama leaves the body, goes up to shamaim. First of all, it gets, goes to get recharged. Like at the end of the day, your cell phone is out of battery, you plug it in. The neshama goes up to shamaim to get recharged. And you know, the way you know if your neshama got recharged is how you wake up in the morning. If you wake up in the morning like a tiger, with no problems right away, and you have energy right away, you know your soul was plugged in to the right place, that it woke up charged with a lot of energy. And sometimes you can sleep 12 hours and wake up like a shmate. And the whole day you're, you're, you're tired. You know your soul didn't go to the right place and it didn't get charged. It's just wandering around in the universe. <coughs> so our soul goes up to Shemaim to get charged. Second thing that it goes up to, it goes to uh, give a, a testimony. It writes a, a, a journal to give an account what I did today. The soul goes up to Shemaim and it writes a diary. I did this, I did this. After 120 years, when the soul goes up to Shemaim, they tell the soul, here, this is, your, <laughs> this is your book. You wrote it. You wrote what you did. That's why we do tshuva before we go to bed. Because if I did tshuva on something, I erase it. I go up. I don't have to write it anymore. And the soul goes up to, a, to, to a court cases to testify against another court or to testify uh, for another uh, soul, like I told you in my case. <clears throat> but mainly what happens is the soul leaves the body. And when the soul leaves the body, if it doesn't have guards around the body, then all these klipot, all these mezikim, these, these outer forces, energy, negative energy, they come to the body and they want to suck a little bit of the kedusha. And in most cases, they actually stay next to the body and they stay in the body. If you would see what's going around your body when you would sleep, you would not fall asleep. Okay. <laughs> the point is that our sages came and they gave us a remedy and they say, you say Kriyat Shema Lamita. When you say Kriyat Shema Lamita, the physical part, what you do of Kriyat Shema Lamita, it's not so physical, but you create guards, guarding angels around your body. That's why we see that you read it, and in all the Nosachim we say the same thing. Hine mitato shel Ishlomo, shishim giborim saviv lami gibore Yisrael, kula machuzeh cherev. We're putting angels around our body, we're putting 60 angels around our body, and we repeat this verse 60, uh, three times. One to guard the nefesh, one to guard the ruach, one to guard the soul, the neshama. But the first reason we say kriyat shma lamita is we're guarding the body. The body is lying on the bed, and I want to make sure that nobody is entering my domain. Kriyat Shema is also is a tikkun. The Rizal says it's mamash a tikkun to the soul for things that we did, all sorts of wrong things that we did. It's a time to do tshuva. But the main part is that I'm guarding my, my, my body. 
And when a person is not particular with saying Kriyat Shema Lamita, then the body is just thrown on the bed. And during the night, the soul is on, on vacation. And at night, these klipot that we create during the day, or even klipot that don't have to do with us, they still come down to this world and they're, they're looking for a body that there's something to eat from. Now, they're not going to go to... to to a body that doesn't have kedusha in it. They, they, these klipot, they look for the bodies that have kedusha. We know that when the night goes down, the same way that in the physical realm it becomes dark, that's because in the spiritual realm it starts becoming dark. Like I said before, nothing happens in this world before it happens in the world above. So around the time of shkia, of sunset, physically the sun is going down. Spiritually, the Midata Chesed is getting diminished and the Midata Din is getting empowered. And that's why darkness comes up and becomes stronger. So it manifests into this world and darkness becomes stronger. But the Zohar explains that when the darkness comes down, the second that there's a complete darkness, four Mashchitim come down to the world. Mashchit is like a, is like a dis destructive angel. It comes down to this world. That's why we right away when the sun goes down, we pray Arvit. And we say, In this verse is the name of these four mashchitim. And we annul them. And we can annul them with, with Kriyat Shema, when we're saying Shema. So even women are mechuyav to say Kriyat Shema. Even though, you know, a lot of people, they, I don't know where they're coming with this. I, many places that I go, they say, Ah, a woman doesn't have to pray. A woman doesn't have to say Kriyat Shema. It's not true. First of all, a woman, according to Allah, has to pray at least once a day. And even Kriyat Shema Lamita, a woman is not as exempt from Kriyat Shema Lamita. She has a chiyuv to say it. The main part is mainly because it affects your soul and your body. It protects your body. Now, if a person is very particular with that, then he guards, he, she, doesn't matter, guards the body. Then at night, the body is lying on the bed. Nothing comes and affects the body. So first of all, the Kedusha, the holiness that you created the entire day, with all your mitzvot and all your good deeds and all your good thoughts, it's, it stays there. Nothing is getting taken. Nothing gets sucked out of the body, out of, out of the nefesh. But more than that, nothing from the outside comes into the body. Now, when something from the outside comes into the body, usually it stays. It's not easy to kick it out. It's like a roommate that doesn't want to leave the, the, the house. Then this energy, this klipa, this power starts affecting the body. In some cases, it affects the body, and in most cases, it affects the brain. Affects the brain. So people become, either they become depressed, or anxieties, or fears, or all sorts of these things that affect the person's mind right away. Moods, and then the more you have it, the more it becomes stronger. And there's, there's many different types of these mental illnesses that affect each person on a different level. Now that's what happens when we go to sleep. We also can affect the body when we are alive. We're just reading now in our parasha that it says that we have to keep Shabbat. And it's talking about Don't, You can't ignite fire where you are. And the thing is that certain things that we do, but especially Shabbat, and especially all the, the, the acts, that the result of the act falls under the category of what's called karet. Karet is a certain punishment, it's a certain reaction that happens when a certain act is being done. There are 36 acts in the Torah, two are positive and 34 are negative. But if a person does them, <coughs> the reaction is called karet, that the nefesh gets chopped off from its connection. The Zohar explains that from our body, where the soul is, to Shemaim, to Hashem, there's a rope that connects us to Hashem. It's a spiritual rope, same way that the physical rope is built from many, many strings, and the spiritual rope is built from, many, from these strings. It's built from 620 strings, corresponding to 620 mitzvot, 613 from the Torah and 7 from the sages. The Zohar calls it Tarach Amudei Or, 620 pillars of light, where this light is flowing backwards and forth between me and Hashem. And if a person does a certain avera, a sin, he cuts one of these strings. He doesn't do one mitzvah, he cuts one of these strings. Now, one would say, okay, if I'm keeping 80% of the mitzvot, so fine, so the rope is not so strong, but I still have a good connection. 
The problem is that some people in our, in our generation, in all generations, they can do an act. A person can halal Shabbat, don't keep Shabbat, and he cuts the entire rope. The whole rope gets cut off. This is called karet. The karet goes on the nefesh, doesn't go on the neshama. And mainly what goes on the karet, a lot of people think that that's it, karet, and, and story is over. We have ten, ten sfirot in our neshama corresponding to the ten sfirot. The karet goes on the first nine sfirot, doesn't go on the sfira or the highest sfira, which is called keter. Keter is a crown. That's only because Avraham Avinu made a deal with a kadosh Baruch and he says, you take all first nine sfirot, the keter leave, that a person can do tshuva. So when a person, chas v'shalom, does avera of karet, the first nine sfirot, they get cut off, but the keter doesn't get cut off, and you see the, the, the hint here is keter and karet are the same letters. Hasidut explains that the karet goes on the, what's called on the external part of the keter, not on the internal part. But the point is that when a person does a sin of karet, technically the body and the soul is dead. That's technically. And the question is, you know, is how can the body still be alive? Because the soul got cut off. There's no chayut and chayut. There's no life. Larizal says that there's some type of uh, impression in the body, what's called reshimu, like an impression, and the body can still live for another 40 or 50 years. But it's, it's like a walking corpse. You sometimes you walk in the street, you see walking corpse, and the neshama is, is out. How do you see it? Any person that is mechalel Shabbat, bemezid, is, you know, did correct? Any person that did any of the forbidden relations, ate on Yom Kippur, ate uh, chametz on Pesach, then the person is, you know, the soul got cut off. The reaction of it, what it will manifest into the body, it will affect the, the brain right away. That's one of the main reasons why people get all sorts of mental illnesses. I'm talking about a more severe mental illnesses. I'm not talking about just a basic depression. Depression also comes from that. Depression can come from many different places. And the thing is that not too long ago, we knew a, a, a girl, she used to come to our Shabbos table, very nice girl, from all her life. One second, snapped, became completely out of it. And when they're trying to figure out, you know, then when they traced it, they saw that in the last year, she wasn't really, she was kind of drifting away and she was not keeping really Shabbat. It affects the brain right away, the brain in the physical world. So a lot of people, when they come and they ask, you know, where these men mental illnesses come from, it, it comes from the reaction of these certain averot of karet, karet and mitah bidei shamayim. The ones that are no great to us is Shabbat. Anything that has to do with Shabbat, anything that has to do with eating and working on Yom Kippur, eating and, and owning chametz on, on Pesach. All the rest of the stuff, it has to do with, with the sacrifices, kodshim, things like that, has nothing to do with us, at least at this point. And the positive ones is Korban Pesach, which we don't have it yet. Bezad Hashem, this Pesach will have one. And circumcision. So, the thing is that we are in control of what's going around us. Exactly like the Mishnah says, Dama lemala mimach, no, what's above you is from you. What I do here in this world, the actions that I do in this world, I stir what's going on up there, and it manifests back, right back down. There are three motions of going up, down, and up. That's why we say, shalosh kudushot, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. One going up, one going down, one going up. Itaruta del tata, itaruta del ela, itaruta del tata. Up, three motions. Going up, down, and up. So what I do a certain action, an itaruta del tata, an awakening from below, then I do one motion of going from, from below to above. It awakens an awakening from above. It throws back down the effect down at me. And then the effect should do another that I do an awakening from below to above. But everything that I do, I actually bring it on myself. So when, I have, when I'm dealing with certain things, especially when it comes to this department, then the most likely it comes from an act that I did. It can be an act in the physical <clears throat> realm, it can be something spiritual, it can be something physical and spiritual, but most of the things that happened to us happened to us because we actually did it. And even things that one might say, yeah, but it's, 
uh, how you say, hereditary, you, you get born with it, genetic. This is a different department. Even in the, even, even the genetic stuff, it means that the neshama came with some type of a blemish, what's called a pgam, that could happen from a different reincarnation. And sometimes a parent can do a certain pgam, a certain defect, a certain sin that affects the neshama of the child, and the child comes down with it. And sometimes, you know, a person on the head of the tree, for the sake of the example, a great, great, great grandparent, do a certain act, <clears throat> and it will affect all the generations below. We see it in, in halacha when, with, with a mamzer. I don't know how you say mamzer in English, but... Bastard. bastard? That, that affects ten generations. Can't get rid of it. So sometimes a, a person can do a certain act. My great, 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 great grandfather did a certain act 500 years ago. Now all the generations are affected. So we, you know, doctors call it genetic. <laughs> yeah, genetic is, is the terminology in this world. But it originates from something from above. Now when a person does one of the sins of karet, the problem is that it doesn't only affect himself. It affects all the generations underneath him. Because we're all like uh, branches coming out of a tree. So the main tree has a trunk. The main part of the tree is a trunk. And then the trunk becomes branches and more branches and more branches. So if I'm the head and I'm a branch, and from me comes all sorts of small branches, when I did a certain act and I chop off the branch, everything underneath me gets chopped off. And everything underneath me gets affected by this karet. So that's why a lot of the genetic things, they're physically maybe genetic, that's what doctors call it. But it originates from the spiritual roots that there's some type of roots above. So ultimately everything manifests into this world because of our actions that we see. That we have, you know, we have clear explanations in the Torah that my actions here affect. Our sages say, it says in the Gemara, that if the Jews do tshuva, miyad nigalim. It says it in, in the Gemara, in Masech and Sanhedrin. If we now all get all the Jews together, hypothetically, and everybody does tshuva, right away Mashiach comes. So we see that with our actions, we, 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 we rule this land. If chas v'shalom, we don't, the Jews don't do tshuva, then we're pushing the geulah constantly, the redemption. But I can do actions and I bring on myself a reaction. That's why when people say Hashem is punishing me, Hashem is not punishing anyone. Hashem is not a mean God that stands in Shemaim with a sword and waits to chop everybody ahead of. A person does a certain action and he brings on himself a reaction. That's, that's how it works. And Shem doesn't punish anyone. If I bang the head on the wall, then I'm going to have a headache. So I did an action and now I have a reaction. <laughs> that's it. So sometimes my re the reactions that I get are small because the action that I did is small. Sometimes the, act the reaction that I get is severe because the action that I did is severe. And the action can be negative, the reaction will be negative. The action will be positive, the reaction will be positive. So if I constantly project energy that is positive, then the energy that returns to me is, is positive. Shlomo Amalek calls it Kamaim Apanim El Apanim. In the olden days, they didn't have mirrors. They used to look in the, in the river, and there was a reflection. In our days, you look at the mirror, there's a reflection. You smile at the person in the mirror, that person in the mirror will smile back at you. You, you, you frown at the person in the mirror, that person in the mirror will frown at you. That's very simple. Same in this world. Whatever I project to the world, that's what projects back at me. And the motion is, in most cases, when a person is dealing with something, that he's, right away somebody needs to be to blame. That's where the ego gets ignited. I didn't know nothing wrong. Everybody around me is wrong. And the ego doesn't allow you to accept that I did something that affected me. We talked about it last class, that our ego is our biggest enemy. The, rea the reality is that anything that happens to me is a reaction of something that I did. And you see in the Nosach, in most of the Nosachim, in the Kriyat Shema that we say at night, <coughs> and Nosach, I mean the type of the, how you pray, it says, etc., etc. I'm, I'm forgiving to whoever made me upset. Or, and then it says, Ben Begilgul Ben Begilgul 
whether it's in this life, whether it's in a different life. So sometimes I come to clear out things that I did in a previous life. And a lot of the cases in this world, when I meet somebody in my path, it's because in a previous life, we also did something and we came back together to fix it. And it can be in a husband and wife, can be partners, can be neighbors, can be just a, a friend, can be anything. There are many, many cases there that, that we come back with a group of people from a previous life to fix something. There's a famous story happened here in Sfat. That many years ago, at the time of the, of the, of the Rizal, there was a, a very rich man, and he couldn't marry his daughter off. For some reason, they couldn't find the Shidduch. Finally, she found this yeshiva bacher, sitting in yeshiva, learning all day long Torah, and she told his father, her father, that's the Shidduch, I want to get married with him. Father wasn't so happy, he wanted like somebody to take over the business, but he was like, okay, well, at least she gets married. So the deal was that he says, I'm going to give the groom half of my fortune to take care of my daughter. And that was the deal. So they get married. And a few weeks later, the bride dies. So the groom now has all this money. So the rich man comes to the groom and he tells him, give me back my money. So the, the bacher, the groom says, Mapitom, why should I give it to you? This is the deal. So he says, yeah, but the deal was for, you, for me to give you the money so you will sustain my wife and my daughter. You, you'll be able to, to support her. But you, she died. You don't need to support her. Give me back my money. He's like, no. That was the deal. The money's mine. So they were starting to argue. So the yeshiva bacher, being a frum guy, says, okay, let's go to the Beit Din. So they go to the Maran, Yosef Karo. And Yosef Karo says, you have to give the money back. So the Bachar, the groom, was like, no, I don't, I don't agree with this psak. I don't, I don't agree with it. I want to see the Arizal. So they go and see the Arizal. So the Arizal says, no, you have to, you keep the money. So the father, the, the, the Gvir was like, what? The Arizal says, you keep, he has to keep the money. The money is his. And the Arizal says, all three of you, the father, the rich man, the groom, and the daughter, the bride, are all reincarnation. And if many years ago, all three of you were partners. And the father, the rich man, and the daughter, the bride, you stole from, from him. He was a partner, and you stole from him. You stole from him a lot of money. And now all three of you came back here, and now he got his money back. Now, if you're going to take the money away, according to the psak, then you're not going to do your tikkun, your daughter's soul is not going to do her tikkun, and you're all going to come back here again. Give him the money. Finish with it. And that was the psak of the Arizal. <clears throat> so we see that in many cases, and it's still happening in this day, it doesn't only happen in the times of the Arizal. We might not have the Arizal now to explain it to us. <clears throat> but many things that we go through in this world with a certain group of people it's a tikkun that something that happened 500 years ago a thousand years ago Hashem brought us all back here together to do a tikkun so we can fix it so we can rectify some type of a problem and when if we let our partner the ego come in between us we'll never be able to fix anything so the the bottom line is that anything that comes to me, that happens to me, whether it's physical or spiritual or mental, it's a direct result for my action. Whether it's my action in this world, whether it's my action from a previous world, previous reincarnation, whether it's my action in thought, in speech, in, a, in an actual action, whether I did a good thing, a bad thing, anything that happens to us, the Gemara says that if a person, something happens to him, if a shvesh he has to go through his deeds and see maybe I did something. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm to blame here. So it all boils down that since we were talking about the mental illnesses, everybody in, this, in, our, in our generation, they're suffering from something and, and it's not something to be embarrassed from. Some people it's more extreme, some people it's less extreme. Some persons just can't sit down on a chair for more than half an hour. One person, you know, has these anxieties. They're afraid of certain things. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. 
some, some people it's more extreme. Some people it becomes, you know, uh, 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 it manifests into the body into a mamasha sickness. Whether it's something simple like an OCD about something or something like uh, uh, all sorts of different disorders. <clears throat> but it all comes down to one thing and it can all be treated. The problem in our generation that everything is treated with chemicals, it's treated with pills. In Israel, I don't know exactly how it is. In Israel, I see that it's also pretty popular. In America, half of America is, is zombies. They're all drugged. Everybody's just walking there on, on, on chemicals. Why? Because doctors, they don't know how to deal with things. So they say, hey, okay, they don't have a solution. Take a pill. You'll feel better. The problem is that people become so addicted to the pills that they become more sick from the pills. But in our generation, everything is, uh, 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 there's no solution. There's, everything is numbing things. A person has a headache, right away he takes a... Uh, Akamol. What do they have here in Israel? Akamol? Novofen? Right away. Why? The body is now reacting to something and the red light that is beeping is you have a, a headache. You take a pill, what you do is you numb the nervous system. That's it. And so you don't feel the pain. You didn't treat the problem, you just numb the problem. And if something hurts in my body, it's my body telling me I, I, there's something going on here. So in our generation, we tend to numb everything. Instead of dealing with, a, with an issue and fixing it, we numb it right away with some type of a temporary solution. So the point is that whether we have it or not, the reality is that a lot of people have it, and a lot of people might don't want to share it, or might they don't want to maybe title it as a mental problem, because it sounds pretty embarrassing, oh, I have a mental issue. It's not embarrassing, it's almost like me saying, I have a, you know, a certain sickness. But everything, anything that is in our mind can be defined as some type of a mental sickness. It doesn't matter how extreme it is, it can be very extreme. It all comes down that we are, we are responsible for it and we can actually reverse it. So, <clears throat> we know very soon Mashiach is coming. It says, the, the spirit of impurity I'm going to remove from this land. Mashiach is going to shecht the Yetzirah. And then we're not going to have these issues anymore. But till Mashiach is coming, then each person needs to understand that everything that comes on, on them, especially even a sickness, then it's coming from their own actions. And the funny thing is that I have this lecture online with the sicknesses, so I got like 5,000 emails. I, I, I have a running nose. What did I do? Uh, I have a, you know, a, uh, you know, all sorts of nonsense. This comes from the environment. This is, um, this is not the sicknesses that I'm talking about. I literally got hundreds and thousands of emails, people telling me, I'm coughing a lot. So I was like, okay, so, so stop smoking. You'll stop coughing. So it's, I'm not talking about basic things. Somebody told me that, they have diarrhea, that they're having a lot of diarrhea. What did they do wrong? I told them, you know, this, this, is, this, is not, this is not the sicknesses I'm talking about. Even, you know, even those are coming from what we eat and, and probably from our, kosher, from our kosher diet. Our kosher diet affects a lot of our health. But the bottom line is to understand and to learn and to take from this that we are responsible for our acts. And we can, we can fix our acts. One of the most important things, of course, is needless to say that one needs to keep the entire Torah. A lot, of, a lot of the questions that I get as a result from that is how can I do 248 mitzvot? Most of the mitzvot, they're not even, we, don't, we can't even do them. It has nothing to do with me. And, you know, if I'm a woman, how can I put filin on? How can I put tzitzis on? How can I do so many things that it has to do with a man? So... You have a big discount because you don't have to do a lot of the mitzvot regardless. A woman doesn't have to put tefillin and tzitzit and many other things. Because until she gets married, that her father is the one who's supplying the spiritual sustenance. And when she gets married, her husband supplies it to her. So a woman by default is in a much higher place. She comes from a much higher source. So she doesn't need to do certain actions to get the, the, the actual effect. A woman with one act can get the exact same result that the man needs to do 20, 30 mitzvot with. But the woman still has a lot of mitzvot, a lot of positive mitzvot that she has to do. And there's many ways that you can do all 248 mitzvot. You can do it in thought, you can do it in speech. The Arizal explains that we have to do, that we come down to this world to do all 613 mitzvot in thought, speech, and action. 
And a lot of the times the soul will return to this world not necessarily to fix something that it did in a previous life, rather that I have to complete my cycle. I have to do all 613 mitzvot in thought, speech, and action. And could be that in this reincarnation, I just need to do five mitzvot in action, 17 mitzvot in thought, and 62 mitzvot in speech. And once I'm done with that, that's it, I'm gone. I'm doing, I'm, I finished my, my cycle. <clears throat> so all the mitzvot, all the, the, the mitzvot that I want to do in speech and in action, then I learn. I open a book, I learn Torah. If I learn the halacha about a certain mitzvah, then I did this mitzvah in thought and in speech. I don't have to necessarily do it in action. So needless to say that one needs to keep the, the laws of the Torah. And the more you are particular with the dinim, with the sablaws of the halacha, then you are really refining the, 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 the layers that are protecting your neshama. You know, I see you all drawing with the pencils. If the pencil is not sharp, then the, 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 the thickness of how you, how you draw has a certain uh, uh, gavan, how do you say, uh, shade to it. Then you sharpen it, it becomes darker. The more you sharpen the pencil, it changes the, the, the shade. So same thing with, with when it comes to halacha. If I just said, a lot of people say, okay, I, you know, I just need to keep the general and, 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 and that's enough. Okay, so you did one layer that surrounds your neshama. But the more you are particular, the more you're sharpening the, the, the pencil, the more you're sharpening the, the, the actual halacha, which you going down to the dinim of every little thing, that's the thing that most affects everything. The more you are particular with anything, the more you are refining your neshama. Neshama is like a, like a knife. You know, you constantly sharpen it, it becomes sharper and sharper, like a knife of a shochet. And you want your neshama to be 100% chalak. You don't have to have any pgam, any, any little blemish on, on your neshama. Same way that if a knife of a shochet has one microscopic bend, then that's it. The sakin is sakin puguma, the, the, the knife is damaged, and anything that is going to slaughter is going to be taref. Just throw it to the garbage. Same thing with our neshama. I don't want to have one little bump on my neshama that will make chas veshvalo my neshama pagum, which will affect my, 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 my life. And the way for me to sharpen my neshama, to be 100% sharpened, is only when I'm very particular with all the little things. A lot of people say, oh, okay, no, I did so many mitzvot today, I'm tired, I don't feel like saying kriyat shmala mitah. This is the most, it's the highlight of the day, it's the 10 most important minutes of your day. And even if you know that you're going to fall asleep, then sick Kriyat half an hour before you go to sleep. If you have to not miss something, is this. Don't miss Kriyat Shema Lamita. And if you want to refine yourself more, then you go more particular on every little basic halacha. And this is a chiyuv that women also have. A lot of women will say, oh, I don't have to learn Torah. No, a woman has the chiyuv to know what she needs to do or what not to do. A woman has the chiyuv, yeah, she can open a book. Because now the books are simple to understand. You don't have to open Shulchan Aruch and start going through the tool. You can open a basic book, a Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, and go through all the dinim. And the more you are, uh, are, are following the refined laws, the more you are refining your soul, the more you become sharper. Sharper will also manifest in how sharp your concentration is, how you see things obvious. Not too long ago, a girl asked me, how can I know when I go on a shidduch that this is the right guy for me? You can find the lecture online. And I tell her, your soul needs to be aligned with your body. If your soul is aligned with your body, everything that you see is very clear. There's no doubts. There's no ifs. There's no maybes. And she was like, what do you mean I have, my soul is aligned with my body? If your soul, or better to say, if your body is doing everything it needs to do, follows all the mitzvot, and is very particular with not, you know... <laughs> bending rules, the soul becomes aligned with the body. The soul is built from five levels. Nefesh ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. You want to align them all together, but then you want to align your body with your soul. When your soul is one line with your body, then you don't have doubts. Things are very, very clear. 
and it can be with a shidduch, it can be with a place to live, a place to learn. What should I do? What should I, where should I go? A lot of people, they, they constantly, they're, they're, you know, they're in limbo. Should I do this? Should I do this? They can't come to a achlata, a decision. And that comes from one of the problems is that the soul is not sitting re really well with the body. There's a lot of doubts. And with this particular question that the girl asked me, she says, how can I know? I'm sitting in front of a person. How can I know that's my other half? This is a serious decision. So of course you want to look at basic information. <clears throat> But if you really refine yourself, comes the day that you're sitting in front of a person, you know, that's my husband. And if not, then you are, I don't know, is this, is that. It's one of the ingredients for Shiduchim is, yeah, you refine yourself to a point that you don't have to deal with this spiritual dirt that covers the windshield of your, of your soul. Our eyes are the windows of the soul. And if you don't clean the windshield, then you don't see things clear. And the way to clean the windshield is that you become more refined, or in our terminology, machmir. You machmir with certain things. And the more you do it, the, the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the reaction comes back at you. And you see it right away. So the more you are going towards a certain direction, you see the, I told you, the reaction comes back at you, and you feel it on yourself. So you become a little bit more refined. You see things become a little bit easier to deal with. Your yetzerara is a little bit more under control. Your te'avot, your desires are more under control. Everything comes under control. It doesn't mean that you're going to get rid of your yetzerara. The yetzerara is here to stay. And it's getting better and better as you go. But at least everything is under control and you can kind of see things in a more clear way and you know how to deal, deal with them. So Bezat Hashem, you should, what you should take from this shiur mm -hmm. is that the more you refine your small things, then it affects things in a bigger scope. And we see it, you know, how do we see that little things affect the big things? You know, when you go on the street and the sun hits you, there's a shadow on the floor. Wherever you go, the shadow goes with you. And the thing is that depending on the angle of the sun, that's where the shadow will be. And sometimes you can put, you'll see like a pole. And the sun will hit from here, so the shadow is there. And then the sun moves, so the shadow moves with the sun. You know, for the shadow to move down in this world one millimeter, the sun... There's a, the movement in the galaxies, the sun doesn't move, the, the earth moves around the sun. But th there's hundreds of thousands of kilometers movements in, in space in order for one millimeter of shadow to move down in this ground, in this world. So one little act in this world, in the, in the spiritual realm, it's hundreds and thousands of kilometers of a movement. So one little refinement in something small that I take on myself, here, it does a huge effect to my neshama. And you know, not too long ago, I, I, I spoke with somebody and she was like, you know, I'm 100% I'm, you know, from, you know, what, 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 what do you mean? What's to refine here? <clears throat> and we started to go through the list. And then uh, I told her, you know, we went through big things and we went to small things. And then I told her, do you do Netilat Yadayim first thing in the morning? Yeah, of course. Next to the bed? Yeah. And then you go and do it with clean water? Yeah, I do the whole thing exactly how I should do it. And then I told her, with the clean water, where do you wash your hands? She was like, when, right before I brush my teeth. I told her, where do you brush your teeth? She said, it's in the bathroom. She does, she puts, washes her hands next to the bed. Right? That's, that's what she does and many others do. It's the right thing to do is to wash right next, to put a bucket next to your bed. And, excuse me? You cover it, you put, the bowl, you put the bowl over it. Or some people put a towel over it. But even so, it's not 100% clean. It's better to, after you wash with this water, to go to a, a clean a, a water. Clean, I mean like a fresh, and wash it again. Long story short, she told me that she does the netilat yadayim in the bathroom. I told her, oh. Can't do that. Can't do it in the bathroom. You have to do it outside of a bathroom. Excuse me? So you go out to the kitchen. Or you go to a sink that's not in a bathroom. 
Technically, according to the din, you're not allowed to do tilat yadayim in a bathroom. Some people say, okay, so I'll close the seat of the toilet. That's the, if you're stuck in a, in a deserted island. But before, you should not do tilat yadayim in the bathroom. Well, you're you bad, you're to walk all the way to the floor. So you go, you go to the kitchen, yeah. I know, sometimes it's annoying, because sometimes the bathroom is on the second floor and there's nothing there. So you're, what, I'm going to go down now and then go up again? So, so yes, yeah, so a lot of people say, yeah, what, I'm going to now spend a whole minute and a half to go down to the kitchen and go up again and the energy and going up and going down. So most people say, ah, no, whatever, no, I'm just, uh, I'll just wash it in the bathroom. And with this particular girl, I told her, you see... This is the little things where you do your fine-tuning, and you might, might, might say, okay, no fanatic, that's nonsense, little thing. I told her, yeah, but you want to get to the root of the problem, so I told you to refine the little things. Here's one of them. So there are many different things that you do your fine-tuning. Now, a lot of people say, okay, I'm not, it's not, that's not my level, it's too fanatic for me right now. Okay, fine, it's too fanatic for you right now. You work on other things. But the point is, that after the little things are the ones that are affected the most. Like I told you with the example with the shadow. Sometimes something, a, a, a star, is moving in the, in, in the galaxy hundreds of thousands of miles and the shadow moves down in this world one millimeter. So sometimes you do one little act in this world and it affects the neshama in such a big scope that... There's an Indian, we know the Zohar explains to us that there's an Indian that most of our avodah, our job in this world, is to do an action that is called itkafia. Itkafia it means to subdue. A lot of people say the ikar, the main part of this world, is doing Torah and mitzvahs. It's not correct. The Talmud of the Rizal, Rabbi Chaim Vital, says that the Torah and mitzvahs are yeah, they're very important. This is like the air and the food for our body, this is the air and food for the neshama. The main thing that we do in this world is what's called avodat midot, refining my, my, my midot. The Zohar says that our, act, our main action in this world should be in a motion what's called itkafia. Itkafia means to subdue. Kad itkafia sitracha. I have to subdue my yetzerara. A certain thought comes to my mind, I stop it right away. A certain desire comes, I want to do something, I stop it right away. And constantly, I have to be in the motion of itkafia. All day long, I have hundreds of thoughts, hundreds of desires, hundreds of the things that I want to do, has to come the, my, 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 my uh, nefesh elokit and do itkafia to subdue my yetzerara. And when I'm able to do that, the result is itapcha. Itapcha is transforming. Itapcha chashocha lenohora. Transforming the darkness into light. And the, and, for, and the Zohar says, itapcha chashocha lenohora meriru lemetiku. And the bitterness into darkness into sweetness. So constantly I have this motion of itkafia. I have to, I told you last time we spoke about the third cup of coffee, that you really want to and you, you hold yourself from that as something that you are permitted to do. There's no isu, there's no prohibition, but you hold yourself, this is itkafia. Now when you do itkafia on the small things, that's where you have the power to do the itkafia on the big things. When you get constantly in the motion, you work on the motion of subduing minor things, then when it comes to a big thing, it's going to be very easy. So it's very easy to say when you're in the bathroom, oh, okay, I'm already here, but well, I'm going to walk down now. But you, if you have this motion of, no, I'm going to be now particular with this little thing, I'm going to go out of the bathroom, I'm going to go downstairs now to the sink, and I'm going to wash my hands, you did something so small, it looks to you small, but the result, the echo, the ripple effect that it does, it affects in such a broad spectrum that by default the big things are becoming easier and your entire Avodat Hashem becomes easier and you're able to deal with much bigger things. It all boils down to the, to the little, little things. That's why you see that the, the, the great... Sages and great tzaddikim, they're constantly are machmir and particular with every little thing because the same way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu medakdekim tzaddikim kichut ha-seara, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is particular with tzaddikim in the, as, as something as thin as a hair, 
That's how we have to be particular with everything that Hashem tells us. And only when once we're particular with these refined things, that's when the big things are just fall into place and are easy to deal with. So Mezat Hashem should all have the koach to fight our little things, and that should affect our big things, which ultimately would affect the Klal Am Yisrael and should bring the Gula, should happen very speedy, should happen very soon. We had enough of it.